Falling over, fa falling over! Ow! So it has come to this. It is finally time to review another Paper Mario game. I reviewed Color Splash when it came out, and that was pretty early in my channel's life. Covering the game was what really launched my career, so it's kind of surreal to be here again. Enough time has passed that Nintendo has made another Paper Mario game, and here I am reviewing it as well. Things have come full circle, and I can't help but reflect on everything. So much has changed. I've changed. I started putting sweet peppers on my pizza. Makes all the difference in the world, and I didn't even know it back then. Before we get started, a couple things. First, whether or not this is a spoilery review kinda depends on who you are. We'll be showing footage from a good number of major areas in the game. It's more than I would personally want to see before playing a game, though almost every single interesting visual element was shown in the trailers, so if you studied those closely enough, I'm sure you'll be fine here. If you're more on the sensitive side, I won't be going into a lot of story specifics, so if you listen without watching, you should be fine as well. I will, however, be lightly touching on a concept that was only shown in little snippets in the trailers because it's a pretty common mechanic, so it's part of the discussion, and that might be a little too much for some viewers. Basically, we tried to strike a middle ground with what's told and what's shown, and ultimately it's up to you to decide if you want to watch or just listen or neither. The second thing to mention, I'm going hard on this game. This is one of those reviews. That's not to say it's a purely terrible game. In fact, in ways, it's phenomenal. You wanna know what Arlo thinks, if it's worth buying or whatever, I say, yeah, probably. It's got a tremendous amount of stuff to offer, even the most hardcore Paper Mario fans. If that's all you wanted to hear, then shut this off and go pick it up. At the very least, you'll love the world and the story and the characters, and hey, maybe you'll even end up liking the rest as well. Plenty of people have. Thing is, I have some major, major problems with how this game is designed. And even further, I feel like it represents some very serious problems at Nintendo. Seeing what is, in my opinion, an opportunity to create another Nintendo legacy gem thrown away for no good reason has really got my critical juices pumping. If you have a tendency to call out reviewers for being too negative or nitpicky or whatever, then you're not gonna like this review. I won't blame you for leaving now, it's just not a review for you. Believe me, I'm gonna give this game the credit I feel it deserves. But if you are asking for a review of Paper Mario The Origami King, you're gonna get a review of Paper Mario The Origami King. With all that said, I guess there's nothing to it but to get started. Whoosh. Let's get the most obvious thing out of the way first. Paper Mario The Origami King is a stunningly beautiful game. And considering the direction the series has been taking, this does not come as a surprise. The first three games weren't so much about paper as they were about characters that happened to be flat. Then Sticker Star began leaning hard into the idea of a paper world, Color Splash perfected the idea, and now Origami King expands upon it by giving us bigger and more unique areas. Once again, everything is made of paper. With Color Splash, I heard it argued many times that the paper world was distracting because it was just so much paper, and the paper thing isn't why we fell in love with the series, etc. While I will admit that that's true to an extent, and it can get a little tiring thanks to the greater focus on paper throughout the rest of the game, which we'll talk about later, when I take it as it is, it's hard for me to find fault in it. The execution is just so wonderful. Because it's not just about being papery, it's about art design, and that's one area the game soars. The realistic textures, the little details that make it look like actual paper, that's not the only reason the game looks great. It's how these areas are constructed. It's the visually rich scenery, it's the vibrant colors, it's how alive the world looks. This is the most visually grand and spectacular Paper Mario by a country mile, and these wide open areas and scenic vistas are always a treat. In fact, there are even some visual elements that are lifted up by the paper aesthetic. It's clear that a tremendous amount of care went into how clouds and water look. And the result is as beautiful as I could ever hope for. I feel like any other kind of style wouldn't have had the same effect. I mean, you're playing a game about little paper people, yet you can still get this very grandiose vibe from it because of these little details. The overall feel of the game is lifted up tremendously by the interconnected world. 
I actually hate that I'm praising this element, seeing as it was the series standard set all the way back on the N64, and if it hadn't taken them three games to ditch the new world map, I wouldn't even bother mentioning the fact that the world is connected. But it is indeed my job to compare this game to its predecessors to some degree to help inform the purchasing decisions of series fans, so mention it I shall. It feels genuinely good to have a real world again. To feel like you're exploring one big place instead of a series of dozens of smaller places with severe limitations on what you might find and collect within them. I will say that it does feel a little linear at times. A good chunk of the game's major areas are kind of strung together in a line. But even in this case, it still manages to make a really big difference narratively. Also making a big difference is the inclusion of wide open areas, which is, I feel, the one single genuinely good idea here that actually expands upon what was already good about the series. You know, like how you're, how you're supposed to do like a bunch. <laughs> Like, like with your whole game? Eh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Harsh stuff comes later. I'm talking about something I like right now. Seriously though, these areas are a breath of fresh air that really help to change up the game's pacing. They kind of ramp up slowly, first with a grassy field, then the desert with its several connected areas, then the ocean, which is positively gigantic and has a ton of stuff to find. They each bring a very fun element of exploration, as well as a simple satisfaction that comes from traveling across a wide area very quickly. Mario normally runs runs pretty slowly, so it's just a fun new mode of gameplay to help change things up. I mean, come on, riding the shoe over these dunes? It's just fun. And to the skeptics who still insist that Origami King's world is just as shallow as the previous two worlds, you are dead wrong. On top of being more seamless, the game brings back the idea of towns that NPCs actually live in. Are they filled with unique races? No, they're the standard Mario fare, and the towns aren't massive or anything. But some of these races have also never had towns in any other game, so this is something new and interesting within the Mario world. And having towns at all is another thing that makes a massive difference when it comes to the game's narrative feel. I mean, having Toad Town back is terrific. It's decently big, it looks great, and I love how the population sort of fills out as you rescue Toads, which we will of course talk about later. It beats Port Prisma by a wide margin, I tell you that much. On both topics of presentation and narrative feel, one of the best things about Origami King is how cinematic it can be. Because of its more open environments comprised of all 3D assets, the devs were given much more camera control than in the first two games. This extra flexibility is utilized wonderfully. Having such a dynamic camera does wonders for comedic effect and in building tension or excitement. Cutscenes are so cinematic and cool that sometimes it's hard to believe I'm playing a Paper Mario game. The game even throws in some pre-rendered cutscenes, which look amazing and are integrated almost seamlessly. Apart from the transition from paper to realistic water, that's a, that's a bit odd. And beyond cutscenes, the game features some gameplay sequences that are just terrific. Chase sequences make a return from color splash, but this time they're way less frustrating. When you die, they no longer send you all the way back to the title screen, which was monumentally silly, and I feel like they're all just tricky enough to add tension, but easy enough that I didn't die a bunch of times and lose all my momentum. And visually, they're an absolute treat. Some of them are legitimately epic and stand out as some of my favorite moments in the entire series. There's a lot of other stuff to love about the visual elements too. You've got beauty and you've got narrative feel, but you've also got that charm and cleverness we've all come to expect from these games, cranked up higher than ever. I am positively amazed by all the different folding animations with all the origami and all the paper manipulation the game indulges in. Discovering all the ways that toads have been folded and hidden is a delight. NPCs interact with each other in hilarious ways. Every area is packed with an immense amount of clever little details. And the confetti? It looks amazing! <laughs> I feel like they must have hired a team of 50 programmers and theoretical physicists to make the confetti look this good. The way it's thrown, the way it all flutters to the ground, the way it fills in these holes in the world. I'll talk about the mechanic more later, but golly gosh, it just feels good. Nintendo has always been amazing at making an action feel good. It's that crazy level of polish that very few companies are able or even willing to aim for, and it's very much present in Origami King. Tossing a bunch of confetti into the air and watching it fall never stops feeling awesome. Hitting a toad with your hammer and watching it unfold is a reward in itself. The way your hammer crumples on anything is just 
Oh, it just, it just feels good. Even the way Mario runs around feels good. And that's because feel isn't just about the animation, but the sound design as well. It's a marrying of the two to make something that, for whatever reason, sends pleasurable feedback to our brains when we perform certain actions. And the sound design here is simply superb. The effects are silly and fun when they need to be, and scratchy and papery other times. This helps to sell the world and all of its themes so well. The music is good too, though I don't think I like it as much as most people seem to. There are some fun themes in there, but not a lot that really jump out at me. It mostly just feels like it works. It's all fitting, but not very memorable if you ask me, and it way too often uses distortion guitars in a very generic rock kind of way. I don't think that style really fits Paper Mario, not even new Paper Mario. Before we move on from the game's presentation, I should mention that the graphics are great, but sometimes the image can be just a smidge jaggy for my liking. A higher resolution or some sort of anti-aliasing would have been appreciated in some cases. And also, while we're talking about the world, I might as well get collectibles out of the way. Origami King offers a very large number of things to collect. All of it goes in the museum in Toad Town. Naturally, there are loads and loads of toads in the world, which are always fun to track down, and they even give you toad points, which can be used to purchase art from a very large gallery. The next major collectible is these little statuettes, which represent just about every character and notable object in the game. They're all over the place and are fun to browse through and look at up close. Then there's a bestiary of sorts to fill out with all the baddies you fight, you've got achievements to earn, and probably other stuff that I'm forgetting. All in all, if you find yourself enjoying the world enough to explore it, the devs have given you a load of stuff to do. You're encouraged to comb every single nook and cranny of the map if that sounds fun to you. I already talked about cutscenes and exciting sequences, but what I want to talk about now is how they tie into the story. I've spent a lot of time criticizing things Kensuke Tanabe has said about the game in interviews, but one thing I can actually sort of get behind is his new approach to story. With Sticker Star, Miyamoto asked him, does it even need a story? And the result of that was a game with basically zero story. But since then, he's doubled down on a new sort of philosophy. The story shouldn't be what is told to the player or acted out exclusively in cutscenes. It should be the meaningful experiences that the player has. Instead of watching characters advance the plot and provide exposition in multiple different places across the game world, bouncing the focus back and forth between themselves and Mario, now it's these fun sequences that make up the plot. When you describe what you did in any given play session, you're going to be describing all the fun and exciting and often just plain absurd situations you got into, like you're telling a story. While personally, I do prefer a deeper plot with all the side characters and stuff, I can appreciate the purity in this new philosophy. If I'm honest with myself, it feels more in line with the spirit of Mario. We'll talk about creative limitations in a bit, don't you worry, but this is an example of one limitation that actually challenges the designers to do more with what they have, and make sure every moment of the game is interesting. I might not be singing the same tune if they hadn't pulled it off, but pull it off, they did. The story, as told through its varied sequences and scenarios, is engaging enough that I rarely have time to miss the more complex plots of yesteryear. And of course, the story is just that much more effective thanks to the game's cast of characters. This is another area where I see some people being stubborn for no good reason. Hey, this is coming from a guy who will probably spend the rest of his life harshly criticizing these games and wishing Nintendo would go back to the good old days. These characters are terrific. Because the plot is less complex and because of the rotating nature of your allies, you don't get to know many of them as well as you might like, but the characterization itself is there, in full force. Yeah, they're still not usually allowed to have real names, nor are they allowed to look too different. Again, we'll, we'll get there soon. But there are multiple Toad characters with unique personalities, and the allies you gain are all very fun. They're well-written, they're interesting, sometimes they have backstories and motivations. They're everything you could want in Paper Mario characters. And I hate to admit this. Most often I find myself annoyed by the obligatory companion character and the whole cutesy, timid, Isabel kind of shtick normally does not do it for me. But darn it, I love Olivia. 
I love her. She's this optimistic but easily frightened little thing seeing the world for the first time. Thanks to her commentary, you get to experience the whole game as though through the eyes of a child, and it's incredibly endearing. Like, if this game sold more and enough people learned about Olivia, I'm pretty sure she would get a big following. She's adorable and absolutely hilarious. Just about all of the characters are hilarious. This is easily the funniest Paper Mario game since Thousand Year Door. Color Splash was also really funny, but it did feel a little overwhelming at times. It was often a little too jokey. Lots of meme -y, reference -y, internet generation-y kind of stuff. It felt like they had to fill every moment with a joke, even if it wasn't particularly good. But Origami King smooths everything out. It no longer feels like the toads are the spirits of Twitter users shoved into toad bodies. The humor is a lot more genuine, more tonally appropriate, more consistent in quality. And you would think one way to fix the humor would be to ease up on the whole joke every moment thing, but no, this game is still a constant stream of jokes, but it all pauses when necessary. And somehow, despite the sheer volume of gags and one-liners, it's all really, really good. They must have had one heck of a good team of writers because this game is written like a good comedy show where the jokes are constant and yet somehow it all lands. I'm telling you, I lost track of how many times the game made me laugh out loud. Straight up a guffaw. And yet, despite being a cutesy, funny game about paper, it's got the emotional moments we've all been missing from the series as well. The game isn't afraid to go some places I did not anticipate, and I've got to give it credit for that. Even though, if I'm completely honest, it kind of feels forced a little. I, I know that's going to sound super pessimistic. Can't you be happy about something, Arlo? <laughs> I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe this just happens to be the exact story they wanted to tell us. But because of other elements in the game, I can't help but feel like maybe they're just throwing us a bone with this sappy stuff. There were some sequences I really wanted to invest myself in, but it all felt a little manufactured to me, and like it didn't quite earn what it was going for. I don't know, I could be wrong, and despite my nitpickery, I'm incredibly happy that the team was willing to bring a little more depth to the series, considering the direction they took with some of its other elements. <sighs> yeah, I guess we've come to it. I've spent a lot of time praising the game, but uh, it's all downhill from here. And we can't stay away from the creativity issue any longer. I'm not gonna go into the entire thing, I've done other videos on the subject, but basically, Kensuke Tanabe has gone on record saying that the team has strict creative limitations when it comes to the series characters and enemies. They're not allowed to alter the appearances of these standard Mushroom Kingdom races beyond some bits of clothing, I guess, and they're not allowed to create new races that actually work within the Mario universe. Just as we've observed for years, Paper Mario has become a snapshot of the classic mainline 2D Mario games. There is a part of me that can kind of see the reasoning. As with focusing on memorable events rather than complex plot, you could argue that sticking with standard Mario characters is a way to maintain the purity of the series. The accessible, even nostalgic simplicity. It's one of those ideas that probably makes sense to an executive on paper, and honestly, if the first few games never existed, I have to wonder if we would care so much about all this. So I try to look at it with an open mind, from different perspectives. And yet, at the end of the day, I can't see these strict creative limitations as anything but a bad thing. Having some small restrictions makes sense, that's how you work with any world within a creative work, but they took it too far. Way, way, way too far. Even before Tanabe told us about the line they're not allowed to cross, we could see it. We saw it in Sticker Star, we saw it in Color Splash, and now we can see that line running through the entirety of Origami King. You can clearly see the artists and scenario writers pushing against that line, banging their heads on it, smashing up against it as hard as they can to wring every single possibility out of what they are allowed to do. Well, we're not allowed to create cool creatures. Ah, unless they are origami creatures, perfect. Oh, but we can't make up new characters with names and stuff. Okay, so we'll give the best personalities to stationary because they exist outside of the universe, so it's okay. Do you remember when Nintendo revealed Bobby and everyone was just so happy that they gave him a name? 
Yeah, guess what? It's not even his name. He says his name is bob -omb, just like all the other bob -ombs, and Olivia only calls him Bobby because she forgets his real name, because he's not allowed to have a real name. Literally not allowed. And they could only make him unique by taking away his fuse, nothing else. It's like an entire character created from loopholes. It's like these restrictions are laws and the team had to figure out how to skirt around them to deliver something at least somewhat close to the experience they probably knew we wanted. A game should be a cohesive creative experience, but this game feels like it's fighting with itself. Let's not even consider how foolish this is from a business standpoint in a world where people fall in love with characters all the time and that love can act as free marketing and even go on to drive future sales. That's a discussion for another day. Even within this game, all on its own, this is awkward. It's weird and baffling to witness. If you've ever played video games before, you've probably come to expect that games with stories have characters, and those characters are unique and have names and stuff, because that's what a character is. I have played video games before, and when I play Origami King, I'm constantly watching the designers and writers bump their heads against that line and being like, Okay, but why? Why do you make a connected world with towns and stuff to make it all feel more real, but then you don't bother letting your characters be characters because that would make them too real? What is that? These are two very different design philosophies that are very much at odds with each other. Like I said, it's like the game is fighting itself. And the thing about that line is that it's moved over the years. Sticker Star was generic Mario to the nth degree, not a shred of originality to be found. Then Color Splash loosened up a bit in terms of what kinds of characters they could work with and how those characters could be altered, and the game was substantially better for it. Now Origami King has moved the line even more, and I should be happy about that. The creative restrictions are looser than ever in this modern Paper Mario, and it makes the game stand so far above the others. And I should be jumping for joy about it, but somehow it only makes me more frustrated. With most games and series, you'll get a pretty good range of opinions, and Paper Mario is no exception. And yet, if there is one single thing that 99% of the fan base agrees on, it's that creativity and variety are only good things. Practically everybody dislikes generic characters and wants more unique ones. The general consensus is that on a creative level, Sticker Star was bad, Color Splash was a lot better, and Origami King is the best of the three. The vast majority of players enjoy Paper Mario more and more the further away that creative line is placed. That is an objective fact. So why can't Nintendo see that? Why do they have to take these baby steps between games? Sometimes I can enjoy Origami King's good parts for what they are, but all the while I can't help but see how awkwardly they skirt that line. And I have to wonder how amazing the game might have been if the line just wasn't there. You're supposed to judge a game based on what it is instead of what it could be, right? Well, I can't. It is simply impossible for me to permanently shut off the part of my brain that wants more because I've gotten more from not only the earlier Paper Mario games, but from, you know, like video games in general. It's a standard set by the entire industry. Games with stories have characters. Characters are supposed to be unique. The more creative a game, the better. When I hear we're not allowed to go past this line, I really hear we're not allowed to make the game that fun because that's essentially what it means. That's what that creative line amounts to. While I play, I see these great ideas stop short and I have to wonder who is making these decisions. Who is setting that line? Tanabe? Miyamoto? Some mysterious IP protection team? And if they're willing to move the line from game to game, that means they're admitting that moving the line is a good thing. And if they're willing to admit that moving the line and loosening up on restrictions is a good thing, and they can even see how people enjoy it when the line is moved, then why is there a line? If you can clearly see that moving the line is benefiting your games, why are you so slow to move it? 
Honestly, it's exhausting. I try to just enjoy what's there without thinking about it too much, but that's not how brains work most of the time, and it's not how memories and experience work. I'm playing a game in a series that used to be creatively satisfying, and now it's not, and I'm constantly reminded of all the ridiculous rules set in place to hold the world back, and it's exhausting. Sometimes when the game gives me something good, it feels less like a victory and more like the devs throwing me a little bone so I'll shut up. You want unique characters? Here's a bob without a fuse. He doesn't have a name, but you can pretend like it's Bobby or something if you'll quit bugging me. Be quiet and eat your dinner. And on the subject of limitations, I'm sure not everyone is going to feel this way specifically, but I feel like the focus on paper actually hurts my enjoyment of the story itself. In the last two games, the paper focus was more annoying than anything because it became the entire focus at the expense of any real satisfying story. But this time, Origami King does have that story. It's exciting, it's fun, and the final chapter is really quite epic. And now I'm finding that the paper thing isn't as innocuous as I once thought. Immersion is big for me. I become the most invested in worlds that are completely unique, not grounded in our reality at all beyond some simple similarities. I want a world to feel real and alive. Origami King's Mushroom Kingdom ticks those boxes. It's big, it's connected, it's got people living in towns, it's got characters, it references the history that Mario and Bowser and Peach all share. But it and all of its inhabitants are also explicitly made of paper. Real, literal paper. And they never let you forget that fact. The characters worry about getting torn and soggy. There are holes in the world and we can see the wireframe underneath. Stationary is the most dangerous thing in the world because of how it can manipulate paper. But where did that stationary come from? Who made this world? Is it supposed to be like an imagination world or something? A child's daydream? I don't know. Beyond gags, I don't actually know why Nintendo leans on paper so hard as a selling point. It's not that interesting. It's not nearly as enjoyable an element as the idea of a consistent, connected Mario world filled with characters and story. That's the selling point, or at least it used to be. For me, being so grounded in the real world is exactly why paper ultimately harms the story. It's hard for me to fully connect with the world when I don't even understand it or why it exists, and I keep imagining that there are humans somewhere making all of this. Even in the game's most emotional or epic moments, there's always that little voice in the back of my mind that's like, yeah, but they're just paper. <laughs> they're, they're not even real. I'm, I'm fighting a stinking stapler <laughs> for Pete's sake. This is dumb. I try to get into the plot and I remember that the bad guy is origami. Like, the bad thing you fight isn't an ancient demon or a diabolical villain with crazy magical dark powers, but the concept of origami. You know, that little thing where you fold up little pieces of paper? It's a bad guy who has origami and he makes it do bad things at you. It is hard for me to care about origami. I mean, it's cool and everything. Culturally, it's very significant, but it's origami. As an antagonistic force, it's really lame. There's no immersion. It's paper. None of it can feel nearly as cool as it's supposed to when it's all just real, literal, human-produced paper. Now here's the, here's the real kicker. Breaking immersion is why it hurts the experience, and yet, we know that that immersion breakage is exactly why it was allowed in the first place. They can only use concepts that specifically don't work within the Mario universe. Breaking immersion is literally their mandate. I'm sorry, but I cannot see the logic there. Purposefully harming your game by creating a world that doesn't work with itself. I just can't wrap my head around the idea. I mentioned the idea that it feels like they're just throwing us a bone sometimes, and that might sound like I'm overthinking things and looking at the whole thing with too bitter a perspective. But you know what? I probably wouldn't have thought that if I didn't see it happening in other areas of the game too. The badge mechanic was one that added strategy and depth to the first two games, and it's been sorely missed ever since. On the surface, Origami King looks like it brings the mechanic back. You can get accessories and equip them to give Mario some perks. But 
the selection is very minimal, and you can only select a limited number of accessories from each category. The leftmost category, for instance, is only for health boosts in battle, and each one you get is simply better than the last, so there's no strategy there. You equip the best one you've got. Some of these force you to actually choose something at the expense of another thing, but none of these are a big deal. None of these actually really augment the way that you play. It's like the diet version of the idea of badges, a, a tiny fraction of the idea that doesn't amount to much. Is it better than absolutely nothing? I guess so, but it does feel like they're willing to admit that the badge system had some merit, yet they're only willing to toss it back in as an afterthought. You want badges? Ugh, fine, here's a tiny handful of them that barely do anything. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. It's the same thing with quote unquote partners. The topic of partners has been one of the biggest sore spots in recent years. In the first few games, they injected the experiences with creativity, added richness to the story, and brought strategic depth to the combat. I mean, they were the whole shebang. One could argue that they best represent what the original games used to be and what the new games have been missing. And when the marketing material for Origami King showed characters following Mario around and talked about making allies, people were ecstatic. They thought this was the definitive return of partners to Paper Mario. I was extremely skeptical and people gave me a hard time for it. But if I may indulge, I was right. Not every chapter introduces a companion, and each one is only with you during their respective chapter. In a small way, I can see how maybe this allows for some unique creative opportunities. These characters are around long enough to help with the story, and they can have a solid arc that wraps up when you leave the area. It's sort of an interesting narrative idea, but they still manage to disappoint in other ways. Only one of them grants you an ability to use on the overworld. Only one! Is it better than nothing? Yeah, okay, sure, but from a design standpoint, it would be less weird to just have none. The inconsistency feels so strange. I mean, every time you get a new character and find that they just don't do anything, it's just like, wh why? And yeah, okay, they technically help you in combat. They're technically there, standing next to you as you fight or as you capture conveniently vague marketing material for your game. <clears throat> but you wanna know how useful they are? The extent of their abilities. Yeah, if a turn ends and you haven't defeated every enemy yet, your partner will automatically do a little attack. It's moderately helpful sometimes. If a couple guys happen to get away from you and it's like, oh, look, I don't have to do another turn, cool. And that's it. What was even the point of having them in battles? Did they do it just to get us to stop complaining about partners? You want partners? Fine, here's your partners. Look, see, they, they follow you around, they stand next to you in battle, boom. Partners, what more could you possibly want? Don't be entitled. I mean, it's possible that instead of trying to appease us just enough, they are actually legitimately trying to give us what we want, but don't quite understand it or something. But that's too hard for me to believe. They know exactly what we want. Every last bit of it. Tanabe said he heard the feedback. And it takes a great understanding of the whole situation, a great understanding of the whole series and all of its mechanics to so carefully, so methodically choose exactly what to give us and what to hold back and by how much. These partners feel like a very calculated bone throwing to me. All right, we can't put it off any longer. We did the creativity thing and now it's time to talk about the game's combat. I've been preparing myself for this for months. Just in case you need a little context, here is a brief recap. I felt that Color Splash's combat was way too convoluted. It took way too long to choose and select and paint and play your cards, so even very simple battles against easy enemies were a chore. I also felt that the combat was way too easy, seeing as you could just throw any random cards at your enemies in most cases and things would turn out fine. 
Having all of your attacks tied to disposable cards was frustrating because it felt wasteful, but then the game threw so many cards and coins at you that there was no semblance of difficulty balance to be found. And of course, battling didn't reward you with anything but more cards and coins, and running from enemies removed them, meaning that running was a quicker, more efficient way of beating enemies than fighting them. It was a system that actively discouraged me from engaging with the game's combat system, which was completely backwards. So going into Origami King, is combat worth doing, was my number one biggest question. Forget the story and the characters and the connected world and all that for a minute. I knew it was gonna come down to that combat. Despite popular belief, as anyone who watched my videos on the game knows, I actually thought Color Splash was a really, really good game in most areas, but it was the combat that dragged it down to an almost unbearable level for me. It basically ruined the entire game. So yeah, once again, this was something that could make or break the experience, and I was very nervous about it going in. And thus the time has finally come to answer that question. Does Origami King fix the mistakes of its modern predecessors? Is the combat actually worth something this time? Well, I wish I could give you a clear-cut answer, but it's kind of complicated. As I said near the beginning, Origami King is certainly worth playing, and that's not something I could say about Color Splash. I say save yourself the headache and just watch an LP for that one. Origami King, it isn't entirely ruined by its combat system, and yet, in ways, I'm even more frustrated with it than I ever was with the combat in Sticker Star and Color Splash. It doesn't destroy the game entirely, but it does drag it way deep down into the mud. For the sake of simplicity, let's talk about the ring system first and go from there, because everything stems from the ring system. This ring is my single biggest problem with Origami King. On the surface, it seems fairly innocuous at first, maybe kinda fun, like at the absolute worst, but remember, this is a review where I do not hold back, and if I have a feeling, I say the feeling, and I feel that this little ring thing is a monument to stubbornness. It is the embodiment of the idea that nothing is more important than new, and that gimmicks trump intuitive design. It perfectly represents why Paper Mario is what it is today. Seem a little overdramatic, a bit too harsh, well, you knew what you were signing up for when you started watching. So basically, the whole point of the ring system is that you've got to rotate and slide these spaces around to line up your enemies for better attacks. You have a limited number of moves, and if you line everyone up, you get an attack bonus. From there, you can choose your attack and your targets. Two by two groups can be hit with the hammer, straight lines can be jumped on. I am exceedingly pleased to report that disposable attacks in the same vein as stickers and cards are gone. Different kinds of jump and hammer attacks are now equipable weapons. They do break over time, but it's nothing like it was before, and you've always got a basic boot and hammer that never break. Boom! That's one problem straight up fixed. This right here, the concept of selecting what to attack and with what move, is the best Paper Mario combat has felt in a very long time. It's basic and intuitive, yet offers the potential for some kind of actual strategy. So then, what's the problem, Arlo? Well, I say potential for strategy because this is not the entirety of the combat. You also have that ring part that came before it, which is the actual combat. This right here, the attacking part, nah, not important. Get that out of here. It's all about the ring. And the ring does everything in its power to harm the rest of the experience. The ring by itself is a little fun, like, simply as a puzzle mechanic, it's a little fun to move stuff around, and it does feel good to work out a particularly tricky problem. There's a nice little chunk of satisfaction that comes from doing it. The issue with that satisfaction is that it has nothing to do with the game I'm playing. Beating Solitaire is fun too, but at the moment I'm trying to play a Mario game and fight some guys. On a narrative level it's frustrating because it doesn't make any sense at all. Other Paper Mario games, you're in a fight. You're taking turns because it's more like a fight simulation, slowed down in order to be more strategic. Your attacks represent real attacks that the character can do. That's the whole point of turn-based combat in any game. 
But what does this ring represent? Why is it with you no matter where you go? What is Mario actually doing when he moves guys around? Why couldn't he do it in previous games? Call it a nitpick if you will, but I feel these kinds of questions are always worth asking. And if a player ends up asking them angrily, then something isn't quite right. And then of course mechanically it's frustrating for a great number of reasons. Like I said, it can feel good to solve a puzzle, but that good feeling is entirely isolated from the rest of the combat. It should feel good to line up all the baddies and get an attack bonus so you can lay into them. But it's not, because it's all too easy to see how this system impacts the battle design and overall difficulty. You always have one move for each group of baddies, and if you line them up and use strong enough weapons, you will wipe them all out. That strategic potential with the weapons? Out the window. None of it matters. If you do the puzzle, you take them all out. At the absolute worst, you don't do enough damage on the first attack, and it takes two. But it's always one or two, because that's how the ring system is supposed to work. It's supposed to reward your puzzle solving skills with easier, simpler battles, thus creating a combat system that is, at its best, easy and simple. Okay, so what happens if you don't do the puzzle correctly? Couldn't you just ignore the ring part for a greater challenge? Not really. See, whoever created this ring system was faced with a dilemma. Solving the puzzle rewards the player, so failing it should punish them, right? But they recognized the puzzles as a potential barrier to entry and knew that if the punishment was too harsh, then some players would become frustrated and quit. So at that point, instead of letting this dilemma clue them in that maybe their system was flawed, they decided to go with the blandest, least committal option. Failing the puzzle isn't really a big deal, it just wastes more of your time. When you mess up, you might have a lot of enemies left over. If they all attacked you every time, that would be too hard, right? So instead, like, some of them attack you? And the game decides how many so they can keep a handle on the difficulty at any given time. There's no real way to know how they're going to do it, or how many of them will get together, or how much damage they'll do. They just kind of awkwardly throw themselves at you a little. And of course, when you're on leftover enemy cleanup duty, the attacking part is a lot more tedious because you've got to initiate these attacks on individual enemies, and the whole thing feels really artificial and lame. It feels like because of this system, where if you do the puzzle, you don't even have to fight, and if you don't, the enemies can't do a lot to you because that would feel too frustrating. The designers have come to another wrongest conclusion possible and made all the enemies nearly identical. I mean, there is very little in the way of enemy variety. A few of them bring some sort of little twist, like the booze disappear, but most of the time they're just guys that you're supposed to take out all at once or that attack you awkwardly and do a couple points of damage. Their attacks are all so samey, yet the specifics change up so much and you cycle through enemy types so quickly that memorizing attack patterns in order to block them isn't really a thing. You just kinda guess or keep mashing the button and hope you get lucky. Not a lot of strategy there. And again, choosing different weapons doesn't do much at all. Have they got spikes? Use metal boots instead of regular ones. Are they flying? Use a hurl hammer. Or don't, because I, know, I never did. That's pretty much the extent of the game's strategy element. You don't need to know your enemy's attack patterns, you don't need to know how much HP they have, you don't need to worry about selecting just the right attack, none of the numbers really mean anything. It all comes down to, did you do the whole puzzle? And then, do you have a weapon strong enough to take them out in one hit? If the answer is yes to both of those questions, there is no battle, just a puzzle. If either of them is no, then it will take an extra turn or two. And that's the combat. I'll admit right now, I am not super great at these puzzles, and a fair amount of my frustration comes from there. I can handle two moves most times, but when they go up to three, it can sometimes take a mighty effort. I'm not the sharpest taco on the Christmas tree, I'm sure there are people out there who are great at this, and yet I can't help but feel like this is going to be a big deal breaker for a lot of others. This would be a terrific game for kids, and yet I can never recommend it to any parents because of how tricky these puzzles can be. Also, pretend I'm great at them for a second. Even when I can solve a puzzle, the only real reward is not being frustrated. Yeah, it's satisfying to solve a puzzle just for the sake of solving a puzzle, I like puzzles fine. But in the context of battle, the absolute best I can expect from these puzzles is me not getting annoyed. Not getting frustrated that I wasted my time. 
That's the best thing these ring puzzles do. Not get in the way too much. Actually being fun though? Ha! <laughs> What's fun? We don't have fun here. Why have fun when you can have something new? Oh wow, I, re I really am going hard on this game. There's actually so much more to say about the combat system, and I am overwhelmed by the idea of conveying it all properly, but I shall try. The frustration that comes with fumbling over tricky puzzles when you're just trying to stomp some Goombas is alleviated somewhat by a number of features. You can use coins to buy yourself extra time to think, and believe me, this takes a lot of coins. You can burn through a ton if you let yourself. But then on top of that, you can throw money at the toads in the crowd. They'll do some of the ring moves for you and refill your health depending on how much you give them. And this is where the final semblance of difficulty balance goes out the window. If it's a three move puzzle, give them 500 coins and they'll solve two moves. The final move is always a no brainer, essentially meaning that for 500 coins, you can solve any puzzle. And solving any puzzle means winning any battle without much effort. When it comes to difficulty in games, I prefer clear boundaries. I like to have separate difficulty modes to choose from. Sometimes Nintendo will include easier options that aren't necessarily modes, like the special boxes that appear in Super Mario 3D World and 3D Land when you die enough times. The power-ups are for people who need a lot of extra help. It's not a separate mode, but it's removed enough from the main experience that it's easy for me to ignore. But it's not easy for me to ignore this Toad thing. As the player, it is my goal to figure out the most efficient way to play a game. I want to maximize damage output and resource income. Naturally, this Toad thing is the best way to play. You probably won't end up making any money from the fight, but you can't put a price on saved time. I don't like how easy it makes the game, but then I remember that the alternative is sitting through a bunch of tedious puzzles, which I don't want to do. So I am once again discouraged from interacting with a game the way it was intended. Tanabe mentioned in an interview that these coin spending options were for casual players, but if your easy mode essentially removes the mechanic altogether, what does that say about your mechanic? Easy modes and special suits and such in other Mario games still require the player to play the game. But when your entire combat system is based on an all or nothing mechanic where doing the puzzle lets you not fight, letting a player not even do the puzzle makes me wonder what the point of your game even is. Having these fail saves makes me wonder if you even thought the ring idea was good in the first place. I said this about the fact that you could beat enemies by running from them in Color Splash, a game that already had combat with almost no reward. I was pleased that I wasn't being forced to engage in a combat system I thought was cumbersome and boring, but I was also annoyed that the devs would be so uncommitted to their ideas that you could just skim over an entire facet of the game and there would be no harm done. And I'm feeling the same thing here. I'm glad they've given me a way to circumvent the annoying mechanic they've created, and yet I'm almost more annoyed that they have so little conviction about their design. It feels like by giving us these easier options, they're almost admitting that their system has serious problems. Don't agree yet? Well, let me tell you about the final helpful option the designers have given us. When solving a puzzle, at any point you can hit the X button and ask Olivia for tips. And no, the help doesn't come from the tips themselves. The help comes from the fact that the game pauses. And while it's paused, you have a nice view of the whole map. Buying time? Giving money to toads? Why do any of that when you can just press X? Just press X! Imagine you're playing Breath of the Wild, and every time you pause, time stops, and you can keep moving, and you can kill every monster like this, and there's no penalty whatsoever. It's like God Mode, just built right into the pause menu. That's pretty much what's going on here. Is this another feature I'm supposed to just ignore, even though it's right there in front of me all the time? Surely this wasn't a mistake on their part. I refuse to believe they could miss such a detail. So then, what's the alternative? Were they really so uncommitted to their system of trying to solve a puzzle within the time limit that they had to come up with every way possible for the player to get around it? It's like whoever came up with the idea pushed it into the game, making a lot of sacrifices to the game's enjoyability along the way. And they knew the ring was great because it was new, and it was a puzzle, and it had to work, so they pushed all the way to the end. But at the very last second, the rational voice way in the back of their mind was like, wait, 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 hold on. 
this could actually destroy the game completely. So that person was forced to be like, okay, well, maybe we can make it all optional. But when everything feels optional, nothing feels necessary. So once again, we find ourselves with a combat system that is more convoluted than it needs to be, oversimplifies what could have been engaging mechanics, and in the end doesn't feel super necessary. However, I will admit that despite a combat system that is perhaps even more frustrating in concept, the combat incentive issue isn't quite as bad as it was in Color Splash. First off, running from battle has a much lower success rate this time, and because there are so many enemies to rush you every time you fail, usually it's less aggravating to just engage. I should be annoyed that I'm not able to run as much, yet from a design perspective, I'm glad that literally avoiding combat entirely is no longer the best option. On top of that, Origami King has way more scripted battles that you literally can't run from. Situations where baddies will pop up unexpectedly or attack you in a cutscene. Again, I should be annoyed that I have to battle them, and yet when they're actually blocking my progress, I gain some satisfaction from taking them out. It's easier to engage with the whole system when I actually have to, and simply running isn't an option at all. Then of course there are the rewards you get for battling, which is one of those concepts that can make or break the whole thing. Even a boring battle can feel a little better if you know you're going to get something for it. Count the wood panels on the side of your house? Sounds like a pretty boring job. Five bucks? Heck yeah, I'll do it! <laughs> The Paper Mario team refuses to bring back anything along the lines of XP, so this time, coins and confetti were their attempt to make up for it. And really, this isn't such a bad idea on its own. It doesn't really matter what it is, as long as it helps you out and encourages you to battle in order to get more. So, do coins and confetti act as sufficient incentive to battle random enemies? Yes and no? Okay, well, when it comes to confetti, it's a straight no. Confetti is all over the place, and you can farm it all you want. Way later in the game, there are like a couple places where it's a little scarce, but I never feel like it's a precious resource. Filling holes is satisfying in its own way, and some of these holes block your progress, but in the end, having a confetti limit does nothing for the rest of the game. They could have elected to make confetti a finite resource and make enemies the best way to get it, thus giving us a satisfying collection system and a solid reason to battle random enemies, but they didn't. I don't know why they didn't. I spent a good amount of my playtime brainstorming better ways to handle the confetti system, but I guess they didn't want to. They wanted it to mean very little, I guess. Okay, <laughs> great. But what about the coins? Well, this is where they were onto something. You earn a lot of coins in this game, but stuff also costs a lot of coins. Accessories don't impact the game too dramatically, as I said, but it is pretty fun to spend your coins on them. Other random costs come up throughout the story as well, and there will probably be times when you're looking at something you can't afford, and suddenly you want to go out and get yourself some more cash money. You can indeed make a good chunk of money from a battle, as long as you don't spend any on time or toads or fail to do a puzzle or get hit at all. It's another thing that doesn't really fix the battle issue, but does help at least somewhat. Later in the game especially, you can bring in some good numbers from a well-fought, or rather well-puzzled battle, so there's a little incentive there. You'll find a lot more money on the overworld though. There are many, many ways to get coins. And the problem is that if you want coins to feel worth something, you've got to stop yourself from trying too hard to get them. Just like I said, it's my instinct to find out the best way to make money and do it a bunch. But if you do that, it won't be long before that feeling of worth goes down the tubes. After the Rochambeau temples in Color Splash, I knew there would be some economy-destroying minigame in Origami King, and I was not wrong. If you make a decent effort collecting the stuff, then eventually you will indeed reach a point where you've got so many coins it doesn't feel like they matter much anymore. And at that point, the issue of weapon breakage is also a thing of the past because you can just buy all the weapons you want. You can only find the absolute best stuff out on the field, but you'll never really need more than you get. And this sort of summarizes the overall issues the game has with balancing. There is no balance to anything. If something is hard, just spend money to get around it. If a resource is limited, just take any amount of time to actively pursue that resource and everything is good. 
If you want any sort of actual challenge, you've got to come up with some kind of strict string of rules and limitations for yourself. With all these little options they included, maybe they thought they were making a game for everybody. But to me, it feels like it ended up being for nobody. The puzzles are too hard for casual players, and the rest of combat is too easy for more experienced ones. It's like they just threw everything they could at the wall, and whatever sticks, eh, that's good enough. Let the players create their own challenge. Forget any sort of balance to the game's difficulty or economy or anything. That's not the game designer's job. <laughs> what are you talking about? So far, I've just been talking about regular battles, but boss battles are a whole thing of their own. And honestly, I'm kinda torn on them. They're sort of on the verge of offering the challenge and strategy I crave. Here, the ring system moves the same way, but you interact with it very differently. You have to use these arrows to make a course for Mario to follow. You can collect power-ups along the way, and you have to land on the right spots to perform the right actions. Since there's no one correct answer at any given time, it all comes down to your individual strategy. Toads can't make any moves for you. And this can be pretty tricky. Again, there is something satisfying about getting it right and moving Mario along this long path and picking up a bunch of stuff and doing just what you need to do. These battles also have a lot of very fun animations. They're pretty exciting at times, and the stationary bosses are each unique with a lot of personality. Every boss has some clever way that they alter the board and force you to rethink your strategy. It's obvious that a good amount of thought went into each boss encounter, and I actually came a little close to dying a couple of times on bosses. Unfortunately, these battles still fall into a lot of the same old pitfalls along with some new ones. Toads might not make moves for you, but they can refill your health instantly whenever you want. So I didn't, I didn't really come close to dying. Also, you can still press X to pause everything and take all the time you need planning your strategy. So yeah. But the biggest problem with these battles is that they're long, convoluted, and don't clearly convey what you're supposed to do. The boss battles in Sticker Star and Color Splash lacked any real challenge because of the thing system. You couldn't beat a boss unless you had just the right thing to attack them with. Sometimes the answers were very obtuse and it could be a chore trying to figure out what to use. If you used the right thing though, you would incapacitate the boss entirely and wipe them out no problem. It was an all or nothing system that compromised the satisfaction of the very act of battling an enemy and wow, am I starting to see a pattern here? Origami King does away with things and I've seen a lot of people celebrate that fact and yet I feel like they're still here in spirit. The game is just more subtle about the process now. Every boss has specific weaknesses. Makes sense. Some of these weaknesses need to be opened up by exploiting other weaknesses. Still makes sense, but it's the execution that's the problem. There's obviously some logic to some of these battles, but it can still take a ton of trial and error to do what you need. All the major attacks against bosses are done using these elemental powers and the thousandfold arms. You'll try to use something that seems like it should work, only for the attack to fail and for Olivia to be like, no, you can't do that yet, you've got to do this other thing first. Then you'll do that other thing and she'll be like, you can't do that from that angle or when he's doing this attack. And it's constantly like this, constantly telling you, no, that won't work. This other thing will, you did this too soon. You used the right element, but at the wrong time. No, don't hit it with your arms. That just makes things worse. You've got to hit it with your hammer from uh, behind, I guess, even though the arms should theoretically work too, but they don't for some reason, but now hit it with your arms. I've decided that now is the time. And the whole time the boss is pummeling you, giving the illusion that this is a tough enemy when it's really not at all. It's just that it's a stupid convoluted process to get a chance to perform one proper attack on the thing. And sure, there are these little envelopes with tips in them on the board and they can help sometimes, but most of the time they don't help enough or you can't find a path that leads you past one before it's too late and you've already messed up. And here's the thing. I'm all for trial and error and learning how a boss works through failure. That's how a lot of games do it. But each of these actions, each thing you try, that's a whole turn. Sometimes that's entire minutes you had to spend staring at the board, dumping thousands of coins into it if you're not into cheating, just to hit a wall and have the game go, wrong answer, try again later. Even worse, these necessary magic circles, they're almost never activated right off the bat. You've got to hit this on button to turn them on. And there's only one on the board at a time. And when you use a circle, they all turn off and you have to hit the button again. And 90% of the time, the button will be hidden in a chest. So you've got to spend a turn getting it out. 
all those turns to set up the right attacks, all those turns figuring out what the right attacks even are, each one with a ring puzzle that can take whole minutes under the right circumstances. And muddling this whole process up even more, the basic mechanics of the board are not clear at first. You've just got to try and fail some stupidly basic stuff, which would be fine under normal circumstances because that's how you learn, by failing. But it's not fun to learn by failing when the stakes are this high. Wasting an entire turn that you meticulously planned out and missing the attack opportunity you've spent multiple turns building up to because the game never told you exactly how this whole system works? That's messed up. You'll be in situations where you're looking at the board and wondering if the arrows are going to work the way you want, or if Mario is going to land on the right spot, or if a certain attack is going to work at a certain distance, and you won't know for sure until you just do it. Your basic attacks work differently in boss battles than they do in regular ones, and range can affect things in ways you don't expect, and you've just got to figure it all out as you go. All of this combined makes for some truly exhausting boss battles. Some of them are no problem, they're actually ridiculously easy, but then others can inexplicably take ages to complete, and there were a few times where they put me into a state of mind that, if you ask me, means someone has committed a cardinal sin of game design. Sometimes when one too many attacks fail and the boss still has so much HP left, I reach the I want to go home point. You've been there before, we've all been there. I don't like this ride anymore, I wanna get off. I just wanna stop. Plenty of bad games can present frustrating mechanics that make a player wanna quit, but there's something even more disturbing when an otherwise good game does this. I want to be playing this game. I wanna see what happens in the story. I wanna explore the rest of this area. I wanna have some fun. But I am absolutely stuck in this situation, and it's going to take a lot of effort and mental energy that I am rapidly running out of to get through it. It is a miserable feeling, but that's what the ring does. It forces you to engage with a system that is directly at odds with what you're trying to do. It constantly grinds the game to an absolute halt, which just about destroys the pacing and makes me actively worry about hitting the next I wanna go home moment. Reaching a boss should always be an exciting thing in any game, but here they only fill me with dread. Again, it's not like every single boss encounter is a bad one. There were a couple of times where I didn't have to do too much trial and error and I was able to figure out my moves quickly enough and the pace went along at a pretty good clip. There were some kind of fun times, but those few pleasant moments were not worth the rest of the times. I still look at every boss and go, why do I have to go around these dumb rings? What is causing that? Why can't Mario just run up to the boss? Why does this have to take so long? Why are you making me do puzzles when I'm trying to fight a guy? <laughs> ah! And you wanna know what makes this battle system even harder to swallow? <laughs> because yeah, there's more. This rabbit hole goes deeper. Oh, this is baffling to me. The game itself presents you with a better alternative to the battle system that it simply chooses not to use most of the time. See, for whatever reason that's not really explained, in addition to origami guys, there are big paper macho guys, very clever. They only exist on the overworld and you gotta just run up and hit them with your hammer to hurt them. This is quite a lot of fun. I mean, it's just fun. Mario's range is pretty short and he's a slow runner, so landing hits can be a little awkward at times, but it's still a blast. It's empowering, it's exciting, it's visually spectacular, it's entirely intuitive, and it utilizes the incredible tactile feel of the game. At first I was just like, hey, that was pretty cool. But as the game goes on, you start fighting bigger and bigger paper macho enemies, and some of them are like full bosses on their own. These are the absolute best enemy encounters in the entire game. They're these delightful little bursts of fun, and they act as a direct contrast to the slow, sluggish ring combat. I can't help but ask myself the obvious question. Why isn't the whole game like this? Imagine if you could use coins and confetti to gain new combat abilities. What if you could use the thousand-fold arms to swing your hammer around to fight these giant baddies? That would be so cool! Why does the funnest combat in the game take up such a teeny tiny fraction of the playtime? Why is it I can just run up and hit these guys, but everyone else does the whole ring thing? 
Why doesn't the game actually realize what's fun? Why don't they take this opportunity to give the series a new identity that actually works and that truly anyone can enjoy? They keep trying to tell us that this isn't an RPG, it's an action adventure, so here you go! This is the alternative you've been looking for. This is different enough that we won't bother you about RPG stuff anymore. We'll look at it as its own thing. No? You just want to do this with some battles? You keep in the ring, they're keeping the... Okay, thanks. Because of all these game modes being so at odds with each other, I can't stress enough how messed up the game's pacing is, as well as the dichotomy of fun. Every time I'm moving around freely in the overworld, exploring and solving environmental puzzles, I'm having a great time. The overworld design is just delightful. And every time I'm forced to stare at another ring puzzle, the fun comes to a screeching stop. And battles can be bad enough when you're already feeling annoyed, but there are some specific sequences that are misery incarnate. Later in the game, there's this whole sequence of mini games that would be fun if they didn't force you to answer questions using rings and figure out problems using rings and put together pictures that have been all shuffled around into impossible nonsense and you only have 30 seconds and you can't buy time and this is the 10th mini game in a row you've lost and you just want to go home but you can't. You're stuck in this game and if you want to continue, you've got to keep going. You've got to do more ring puzzles. More, more, more. <sighs> There's one very important encounter in the game that's super epic, super exciting. You've got to do this real-time action-y sequence and your blood is pumping and you're feeling strong and awesome and it lasts a couple minutes before, guess what? Now you've got to put a picture back together and you can't buy time and if you take too long, you get a game over and have to start all over and every few seconds you're interrupted by an attack you have to dodge. It's one of the most exciting moments of the game and that too, just had to put everything on pause while you work through a tedious puzzle, thus destroying your momentum. Because we came up with the ring system and we're gonna stick it wherever we can, doggone it, because it's the new thing, and even when it's completely at odds with everything else the game is trying to do, we will force it in. And speaking of forced mechanics that don't do anything to lift up the game, are you wondering why I haven't really talked about confetti and the thousandfold arms much? It's because they're nothing mechanics. If there's a hole blocking your path, fill it with confetti. Done. End of mechanic. Again, confetti doesn't feel really limited, so it essentially costs you nothing to throw it. It feels good, like I said. It's certainly enjoyable in a visual sort of way, but it doesn't do much. Then the thousandfold arms, don't even get me started on the thousandfold arms. Stand on the magic circle, find the grabby spot, and pull it. That's all of it. That's, that's it. <laughs> The game constantly gives you prompts telling you what to do and which way to pull, which removes the small amount of fun potential this might have had. You don't have to figure out how to move something. You don't use the ability to manipulate puzzles or anything. You just grab and pull. Can't move forward, stand on a circle, grab and pull. Puzzle solved. Having to beat an enemy first or find the circle is about as far as the excitement goes. At first I was really annoyed by this mechanic because the motion controls are janky and awful. But then I realized that you can turn off the motion controls and just use a stick and button, which upgraded it to benign. <sighs> Thanks for the failsafe, guys. So in the end, it's just another paper-related mechanic that acts like it's really important. It's a part of the game's very identity. It's in all the trailers and in all the official art, and yet, it's nothing. It doesn't even make narrative sense. Like there's no good in-world explanation for why it even happens. It serves some purpose in boss battles. It can be a nice flashy finisher, but outside of battles, it's nothing. It feels like it's something they included simply because paper and because new. When I decided to give this review the overly long and critical branding, I remembered that I used one word to sum up the entire Pokemon Sword and Shield experience and that I could do the same thing again here. It was rather serendipitous actually, because even before I'd made the decision on the title, I had a word in mind. As I said before, I could be completely wrong about this game's design decisions and the motivations behind its biggest decision makers. But the feel I get from Origami King it feels like a project driven more than anything by ego. Is it Tanabe's ego? Tabata's ego? Miyamoto's? Someone else's ego that we don't even know about and everyone is just following orders and doing the best they can with what they're allowed? I don't know. 
I will admit that this feeling has been colored by the interviews done with some of these people, but I don't really want to point fingers at individuals. Whether it was one person or many, it does feel like some sort of ego got in the way of making this game. It's this weird stubbornness, this unwillingness to actively pursue what's working with your game and what's not working. Essentially, everyone wants a more creative world. Too bad, the right person decided that we have to have all these arbitrary limitations. Paper mechanics that no one cares about and that don't accomplish much of anything? Keep them in. It's more important to have paper-themed stuff than it is to have a consistent experience. A battle system that's so convoluted you've got to put in a bunch of fail-saves so people don't even have to engage with it most of the time if they don't want to? Most important part of the game. The only reason it exists. Everyone complained about not having any incentive to battle two games in a row? Let's do the bare minimum to fix that a teeny tiny bit. We'll never use anything that resembles an XP system though, because that would make this an RPG, and it can't be an RPG because someone at Nintendo with a great big ego decided that the game not being an RPG was more important than it being fun and well-designed. I've said it before about Color Splash, and I'll say it again about Origami King. It would not take much to make battles feel completely worth doing, which would dramatically improve the game without even touching the precious ring mechanic. You could use systems that are already in place. The game gives you special hearts that permanently increase your max HP. Sometimes you can find them or earn them, which is cool, but most of the big ones are just at arbitrary points in the story. Like they're just sitting there. They just threw them all around because they couldn't think of a better place for them. And these hearts help you instantly defeat enemies on the overworld with a first strike. Olivia specifically mentions how you're getting stronger after each one, which comes across as really awkward. Then beyond that, after you beat every major boss, your max confetti increases. So how about having a simple XP system like in the old games where when you gain a level, you can choose between HP, max confetti, and base attack and defense stats or something. Just a little tiny something to give you some sort of sense of progression and incentive to battle. Heck, don't even use XP, just use coins like you've already got. Make it so you have to buy all these stat increases with your coins. No, 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 break it down even more. Get rid of everything but the special hearts and have them acquirable through battles in at least some way. Even if the hearts were the entirety of the progression system, that could still work. The more you fight, the more HP you have and the less you have to bother with smaller enemies. That's a perfectly good incentive. In fact, that is so simple and would work so well that it almost feels like the hearts were actually designed to be part of a progression system, but they had to make sure to give them to you unexpectedly and not as a reward for battling, just so no one could say this is an RPG. Call me a conspiracy theorist if you will, but it feels like more of that awkward sidestepping, bending the game to fit a rule set that makes no sense to anyone. Battles only give you coins. End of story. They can be useful, but not as much as you would like. People have different opinions, and I try to make it clear that my opinions really are just opinions. But I'm willing to go out on a limb and say that the way they have it now is objectively poor game design. If you have a progression system and you have turn-based RPG style combat, marrying the two is how you motivate and empower the player. Bringing back some form of XP or even something vaguely similar isn't something they should do just because it's the way it used to be, but because it's a superior way to do it. They did it before because it was a good way to do it. They avoid it now because doing it the old way is against the rules, even if the new way is just worse. A lot of people have accused me, and of course most other quote, thousand year door fans as we're now called, for clinging to the past and being unable to let the series change and enjoy it as its own new thing. But that's not true. You know who's actually having a hard time letting go? the people who make Paper Mario. I'm all for accepting modern Paper Mario as its own uniquely fun thing, but it's not its own thing. It's still imitating the games that came before it. The Paper Mario series has changed. It should be taken as a different series now. Okay, then why does it still use the exact same visual style and general combat mechanics and name? It's an action adventure game, not an RPG. 
Okay, then why is there still turn-based combat? If it wants to break away so much, then why doesn't it do it? It's already full of dungeons and puzzles and stuff like a Zelda game, so why didn't they just make all the combat real-time? Why do they claim to want to leave the old games behind entirely, yet they keep inching closer and closer to them in terms of world and story? Why do they tease us with stuff that's like badges and partners, but not quite? And in this weird mix of old and new, why does it feel like only the old stuff works and most of the new stuff just gets in the way? People say it's not fair to compare Origami King to the old games, but it's absolutely fair. If the development team can't consider modern Paper Mario its own new thing, I'm not going to either. If you want to do something completely different, make a new series. But this is a Paper Mario game. The old games presented me with mechanics that were crafted to deliver a consistently engaging experience. Origami King presents me with alternatives that don't feel very well thought out. It doesn't feel like an action-adventure game. It feels like an RPG gone wrong. No, that's not nostalgia. No, that's not stubbornness on my part. It's just how video games works. <laughs> it's how design works. It's how genres work. And honestly, even without the old games to compare it to, I will argue to the bitter end that Origami King is an absolute mess in terms of design. It's got all these problems, and the whole time I'm playing, I'm coming up with little ways they could balance things out. I've mentioned multiple. Here's another one. I talked about how the thousand-fold arms don't amount to much because you just stand on a magic circle and do it and it's done. I also talked about how the game presents confetti as something you might run out of but then gives you all you ever need, which is a wasted opportunity. Okay, so how about the thousand-fold arms use up confetti? Then, if you combine this with my other idea, if confetti was just a little more scarce and mostly only found in battles, all at once, you've given the player a reason to battle, made confetti feel more valuable, given a more solid narrative reason for Mario's arms to get big sometimes, and put a limitation on the ability to make using it feel a little more impactful. Four problems fixed in one go. Teeny tiny changes to the game we already have. But it feels like identifying and fixing problems was not on the agenda at Nintendo when they made Origami King, and that idea baffles me to no end. I myself am an aspiring game designer, and I've spent many an hour ironing out mechanics, tweaking them, studying how they work together, scrapping entire ideas that I was once in love with because they had some flaw I couldn't work out, or they didn't mesh with the rest of the mechanics. I see this in tiny little low-budget indie games. I see people who are only just starting out on their own working really hard to carefully craft and balance their games. Because how the player interacts with your game and how all your mechanics work together is the foundation of game design. But not when Nintendo's working on Paper Mario, apparently. Those questions that even the most inexperienced game designers are asking themselves? Well, Nintendo, with all its legendary studios and designers spending tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars working on a AAA game based on its absolute most treasured IP, can't be bothered. It's a family game, right? It's for kids or something, so who cares? And I find that disturbing. Very, very disturbing. It's frustrating not only as a Paper Mario fan who wants a better game, but also as an aspiring developer who will absolutely, 100%, never have the same budget and properties Nintendo does. The same opportunity to make a mind-blowing game based on a treasured character in a series that used to be treasured itself. I spent a lot of time praising Origami King, and that's because it's got so much good stuff going for it. In ways, it even outshines the precious thousand-year door. And the bad stuff isn't quite as bad as it used to be, or at least the game is a little better at keeping me just engaged enough to not quit, so I should just be happy that we've finally got a Paper Mario game that's worth playing. But I'm sorry, I'm not. In fact, the closer Paper Mario gets to what I'm looking for, the more frustrating it is that they're not letting it be the series it wants to be. The more tantalizingly close the experience gets to being great, the more painful it is to see it all brought down by these awful design decisions. The highs are higher, but that just brings you crashing down harder than ever. This game honestly had the potential to be one of my favorite games of all time. It could have been everything as beloved as the original games. It could have been better. 
but making an incredible game that would go on to become a classic and live forever in the hearts of millions? Just not what Nintendo wanted to do. They wanted to do something new. They wanted to make it about paper. They didn't want to think too hard about how to make the game great, because in the end, that wasn't as important as catering to the almighty ego. Just to make even more people mad, I once thought that Star Fox Zero represented everything bad about Nintendo. I felt that the level design ranged from serviceable to awful, the presentation was only okay, the recycled story was a huge missed opportunity, and on top of everything, it forced me to use a gimmick that ruined what was already a mediocre experience. It was every bit of Nintendo ignorance rolled into one. But now I feel that Origami King best represents Nintendo's bad side. Nintendo has got a legion of extremely talented developers at their disposal, and they often put out games of extremely high quality, the likes of which you won't find anywhere else in the industry. They know what they're doing a lot of the time, yet they have a lot of serious issues. Origami King's ring system represents how they too often pursue newness rather than fun. Its lack of difficulty balancing represents how they sometimes dumb games down in a fumbling attempt to make them accessible. Its arbitrary creative limitations represent Nintendo's hesitance to be too imaginative with their legacy IPs for fear of compromising nostalgia factor. The dichotomy of quality that runs through the entire game represents how they're so, so great at what they do. And yet there's so often something really dumb holding them back from making eternal masterpieces and completely dominating the industry. Throughout the whole experience, I could see some very talented designers actively fighting against the creative limitations and the poorly implemented mechanics. And that inconsistency represents the corporate culture Nintendo has been trapped in for decades. Where senior staff members harm or even destroy entire projects because of their flights of fancy, and there's no accountability system in place on a company-wide level, leading to a game output that is also very inconsistent. The mulish, heel-digging refusal to listen to what millions of fans want, instead leaning even harder into concepts that have been almost universally panned and have led to extremely poor PR and, by extension, sales, represents their tendency to make objectively poor business decisions. Why? The ego is all I can think of. There can't be another reason. You're a big corporation. Making money is your number one job. Millions of your customers want something. You did that thing before, and when you did, it led to the most critical acclaim and the greatest sales success when considering attach rates. More people have since then been exposed to that thing and are hungry to have it again. Considering modern tastes and trends, that thing would resonate with people more than ever and potentially lead to a massive expansion of your series. You have the experience and the skill necessary to give it to the people who are screaming for it. You have a whole team at your disposal that is eager to deliver it and you just don't wanna. I am making a product with the goal of people buying it, and I am deciding that what those people want doesn't matter. It takes a very big ego to make a decision like that. And because of that ego, whoever it belonged to, Paper Mario the Origami King is an okay game. I enjoyed the experience most when I just sort of shut off my brain and tried not to think too hard about anything. Even then, frustration always crept in eventually because there's only so much I can ignore. In the future, I'm sure I'm going to look back on some of the stuff in the game and think, oh man, what an amazing experience. I've got to play Origami King again. As I do with many of Nintendo's games that even today stand the test of time and are enjoyable again and again and again. But then I'll think about it for another moment and remember, oh yeah, that means I would have to like, play Origami King again, <laughs> and I will probably change my mind. It was absolutely worth playing once, but after this, I'll probably just save myself the time and skim through an LP for the good parts. And that's the best we can get from Nintendo when it comes to Paper Mario, apparently. That's the best we're allowed to have. We have good enough to buy, technically. Good for a lot of it. Good if you just shut your brain off and not think about it too much. Good for what it is. <sighs> Great. Quite the legacy this company's got. Good to see it being upheld. Hashtag playbug fables.
well, there you have it. I know my opinion is not in the majority. Most people who play Origami King seem to like it just fine, and as always, I must reiterate that I respect those people's opinions. But whatever the majority opinion might be, however people might respond to all this, I've got to stay true to myself. This game made me feel a lot of things, and I have now said all of those things to you. So it, uh... It is what it is. If you stuck with me through the whole video, I thank you from the very bottom of my heart, and I hope you found it at least somewhat enjoyable. <sighs> uh, at this point, I am much too exhausted to come up with a good outro joke, so all I'll say is... Have a good one. Love you!